kamay Mga mapagbayani Sa harap ng pagsuko Huwag kang susuko Bigyan ang boses Ang sigaw ng masa Ang bagong pag-asa Ay mula siyo Mula siyo Mula siyo Panibagong pag-asa Ay mula siyo Hello, my name is Mahar Lagmay, and I'm here to talk to you about disaster risk reduction and management. But before we talk about or even understand the meaning of disaster risk reduction and management, we have to first understand the meaning of a disaster. According to the United Nations, a disaster is a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or a society at any scale due to hazardous events interacting with conditions of exposure, vulnerability, and capacity, leading to one or more of the following, human, material, economic, and environmental losses and impacts. When we talk about disaster risk reduction, it really aims to reduce the damage caused by natural hazards like earthquakes, floods, droughts, and cyclones through an ethic of prevention. There is no such thing as a natural disaster, only natural hazards, which I will explain later on. Here in the Philippines and elsewhere in the world, when you talk about disaster risk reduction and management, we normally hear the words pillars. And these pillars refer to the pillar of prevention and mitigation, preparedness pillar, the response pillar, the Rehabilitation and Recovery Pillar. You might want to think of all of these pillars, which are very important for our disaster risk reduction management efforts to be effective, as uh, that of uh, preparations on prevention and mitigation long before the hazard strikes. When you talk about preparedness, you are really referring to what we do just before a hazard makes its impact. Like, for example, when a storm or a typhoon enters the Philippine area of responsibility, the government agencies uh, group together, they meet up, discuss, and uh, try to prepare for the impacts of the hazards a couple of days or a couple of hours or a couple of minutes just before the typhoon makes impact. And then we talk about response. Response is another pillar which is very important in disaster risk reduction and management. That is during the hazard uh, or when the hazard makes its impact, when it's there, while the typhoon is crossing, for example, the Philippine land territory. And then when we have a disaster already, there are effects which we need to address. We need to bounce back. We need to rehabilitate and we need to recover from the harsh impacts of any type of hazard. These pillars are very important because if we do not address each of them, then we will be failing in an important part of disaster risk reduction and management. But as you can see from what NDRRMC has done, they have uh, adopted the concept of preparation first, long before, uh, a hazard strikes and uh, recognize that it is very important because as the old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Hence, if you look at that spiral going up, they put emphasis, uh, half of that circle uh, refers to prevention and mitigation. And the other three parts, preparedness, recovery, and rehabilitation, uh, response and rehabilitation and recovery are just comprising one-fourth of the pie or one-fourth of that circle. Prevention and mitigation is very important and that must be done long before the hazard strikes. If you talk about climate change, we prepare now, not 30 years from now. Uh, we prepare today because the impacts of climate change are projected to be impacts of the future. Normally in the Philippines, when we have uh, disasters or when we have disasters, many people are, are caught by surprise. 
uh, they are caught by surprise because of the lack of preparation, the lack of planning, the lack of knowledge. Uh, if we have this thing going on forever, then we will never be successful in disaster mitigation and we will always have disasters in the Philippines with a lot of losses and maybe a lot of loss of lives. So we put emphasis on prevention and mitigation that's preparing long before the hazard strikes and anticipating the impacts. You might want to uh, listen to this because this is very important, uh, an important observation. Normally when uh, there's a disaster and media tries to interview survivors, what they normally say is that this has not happened before. This is the first time you have experienced such a big flood. It has never happened before. This is the first time that landslides have ha has happened in this area. Government officials, uh, common people, the residents, the individuals in the community, if they survive a disaster, they always say that. It's very, very common. And that only tells us one thing, that they were not knowledgeable, they did not prepare, they got surprised. And that means there was lack of preparation. There was lack of prevention and mitigation efforts, knowledge building, capacity building, because if they did anticipate that future hazard, then they would not say that anymore. Uh, they would say, oh, we prepared for this. We expected this kind of uh, event, a bigger event perhaps than what they have experienced. We, were, we came prepared, but uh, uh, because of that, there was minimal loss of lives and there was a successful effort in risk reduction. That is what we want to achieve. We want to strengthen our prevention and mitigation efforts because that is the key to disaster risk reduction. Not to say that all the others are not important, they are equally important, but we put emphasis in prevention and mitigation because we not only save a lot of money, but uh, we also save a lot of people because of the preparations and uh, a, uh, a lot of resources, a lot of uh, properties are saved due to this. The United Nations also emphasizes that disaster risk reduction is uh, equal to hazard times exposure times vulnerability. So just by looking at this equation, we come to realize that, ah, Risk is different from the hazard. So how is it different from the hazard? Uh, a hazard may occur in an unpopulated area, in the hinterlands, in a very remote area, and not disrupt the, the area uh, in terms of the manner by which we live. Uh, it will not disrupt the area because there are no people there. And therefore, because nobody is exposed, and there are no vulnerable people, then the risk is low. However, if the hazard strikes in a populated area uh, where there are a lot of uh, buildings, a lot of people, a lot of high value property, or a lot of property, just it doesn't have to be high, uh, and a lot of vulnerable people who don't have capacity, uh, they have, uh, according to uh, the United Nations, uh, what we call as a high disaster risk index. So when we talk about risk, it is not just the hazard. It's not just the earthquake. It is not just the flood. It is not just the landslide. But it's really an inter interaction between what the people do, where they get exposed to hazards, and how vulnerable they are, what their capacity is, and that equates to what we call as disaster risk. So that means that we can do something about all of these uh, adverse impacts of hazards uh, by reducing, by, by planning well, by being smart, by being knowledgeable, by preparing, we reduce the risk of these hazards that has been around for the longest time, even before people came to inhabit the land.
or the, the world. When we talk about hazards, so now we're talking about hazards, we have to define because uh, each and every word is very important. Uh, we cannot make a solution to a problem if we do not understand the problem. Now, we have to de 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 start from the definition. We have to understand each and every word and take it to heart. Because if we don't understand, how can we prepare? So we have to go through this process. And that process is understanding, education, knowledge building. If we are not educated about all of the hazards, we cannot be able to understand the correct means of addressing the harsh impacts of hazards. So let's start by doing the, uh, uh, by reading the definition of hazard. It's a process or a phenomenon or human activities. So it can be man-made that may cause loss of life, injury or other health impacts, property damage, social and economic disruption or environmental degradation. So that is the definition again of the United Nations. The source is prevention.web. Uh, when we talk about vulnerability in the equation, it refers to the conditions determined by physical, social, economic, and environmental factors or processes which increase the susceptibility of an individual, a community, uh, or systems to the impacts of hazards. So uh, probably in Tagalog, I, I would um, give some examples such as uh, for example, if you are uh, not knowledgeable, you are vulnerable. If you do not have the means to transfer to another place to seek shelter, because there was no shelter in that community, it was not well planned, you are vulnerable because you are, you are in the path of, of a hazard. If, uh, for example, you go to, all of you go to an evacuation center, and uh, you are there and you are not allowed to get out. You are both exposed and vulnerable because you have no means of getting out uh, because the LGU asks you to go there and you're not allowed to go back to your home. Vulnerability uh, involves a lot of factors, the physical, social, economic, and environmental factors. Uh, normally, when uh, there are many people who are poor, that increases the vulnerability of the area. But it, not, uh, it does not uh, mean that uh, the rich cannot be affected by hazards. Everybody's equal when it, terms, uh, when, when it uh, comes to exposure, uh, when it comes to being impacted by any hazard, everybody's equal. The rich and the poor can get hit by floods, can be affected by earthquakes, can be buried by landslides. So vulnerability is an important concept in the equation of disaster risk. The third one is exposure, which is the situation of people, infrastructure, like housing, production capacities, and, and other tangible human assets located in hazard-prone areas. Uh, we see here in that background the exposure of New Bataan. Uh, the white part, it's, it's a little bit, uh, uh, there's a, a lot of transparency in the picture, but you can make it out. It's uh, well labeled. That's the New Bataan area. Uh, it's a relatively new area that has been built or that has been developed. And the people there in, in that uh, uh, municipality were evacuated to that part called Barangay Anda. And you can see that the hazard was uh, right there where they were evacuated in that red colored part of the image in Barangay Andap. Had they stayed in New Bataan, there was less uh, risk because there was less exposure from the hazards. The red parts are actually la uh, debris flows, which is a very hazardous landslide phenomenon. So they were evacuated there. They were exposed, as you can see in the map. They were vulnerable because they could not uh, leave at the very last moment because the LGU requested them to go there, some forced to go there. And the hazard impacted that evacuation site. So maybe we can get an idea of what these terms really mean. Hazard is different from the exposure, is different from the vulnerability, 
but when combined, it defines what we call as disaster risk. Let me give some more examples. Uh, we have this program called Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards from 2012 to about mid-2016, uh, which was quite successful in, in the sense that it was able to map out uh, in, in, in uh, detail the flood hazards, the landslide hazards, and storm surge hazards of the country. Uh, that is quite expensive, but because the University of the Philippines did it for a very cheap price, it turned out uh, to be not that costly investment. Uh, UP, by the way, is a public service uh, university. It's part of our mandate as the national university. Now here we see in that map, uh, it's online, by the way, this uh, NOAA UP.edu uh, PH website. Uh, it's labeled flood hazard, uh, and then there's exposure, and there's a landslide hazard. So those red parts indicate high hazards from flood, from landslides. And you can see a community uh, there, uh, overlain with an orange and yellow type of hazard from landslides, or that might be floods. But I think that's a landslide hazard. So you have that hazard, you have that community that is exposed. We have to determine whether they are vulnerable or not, if they have the capacity to flee from a flood hazard or a landslide hazard during the time of impact. Normally, when it is a time of the wet season, when there are a lot of typhoons that come in. And when we are able to define the hazard, we define the exposure as well. And from then on, we can also define the vulnerability and see whether that certain community or part of the community has a high risk in terms of disasters or hazard impacts. So another part, you see uh, areas there which are not exposed, uh, communities which are not exposed. There are no building footprints there. And what we really need to do in the Philippines is we have to define all of the building footprints. You see uh, a time lapse of the mapping out of all the buildings uh, at, the, uh, at the start before and then after the efforts of UP came in, we mapped out all each and every building, each and every road uh, of uh, 11 properties provinces, but we were not able to complete all provinces, but it needs to be done because that is the exposure as defined by the United Nations. We need to map it up all out. Quezon City is all mapped out. You might want to help the efforts of the open street mapping group. Uh, you can help out. You can map out all of the buildings in your community, in your province to complete the picture of the exposed elements in the country. That is an important element of the equation on disaster risk. For example, this is part of Cavite, that's uh, along General Mariano Al Alvarez. Uh, I believe this is Carmona. Yes, it is Carmona. You can overlay the hazard because you know the exposed community, you know the number of buildings, you know the population. You know the other parameters, like for example, how many people are pregnant, how many are female, how many, how many are above the age of 60, are above the age of 80. When you cross or overlay all of these hazards against the exposed element and the knowledge of the vulnerability of the community, you will be able to assess the disaster risk. And assessment of the disaster risk allows you to prepare for the needs. Uh, here, the estimated population is 76,000. You know the distribution of those affected, whether it's from a high hazard, a low flood hazard, or a moderate flood hazard. The distribution of males, females, youth, adults, because you would need these counts to prepare for the food packs and medical supplies that you put in the area in advance before the hazard strikes. It also allows you to look at other uh, information that are necessary for the preparation stage, stage 
uh, when the the hazard is about to make its impact. So you prepare for the needs in terms of the number of rice packs, in terms of the clean water that's necessary, drinking water. Uh, clean water is different from drinking water. Uh, family kits that are necessary to be prepared, toilets, uh, the number of adults uh, for pregnant women, the rice for pregnant women, uh, hygiene packs for women. These are just examples of how a community prepares long in advance. You need to know the demographics. You need to know the exposure. You need to know their capacity. You need to know their vulnerability. Because if you don't prepare for them, when the hazard strikes, you will be caught by surprise, you're caught unprepared, and there will be a disaster. There will be a large number of deaths, not just from the impact of the hazards, but secondary impacts uh, because the community did not anticipate, were not knowledgeable, and did not know. So knowledge is key. Knowledge is very important. And we need to get this knowledge uh, mainstreamed into the community efforts. There's, there needs to be a lot of education. Okay. So these are just examples. It can be a lot of things. Uh, those examples must be planned across all sectors. Now that we have COVID, we realize that a certain type of crisis affects all sectors of society. It has affected everybody, no exceptions. Even the agricultural sector, the coastal, water, health, forestry, biodiversity, the environment, the ener energy sector, education, tourism. COVID-19 has effect affected tourism a lot, infrastructure, settlement, even mining, the mining sector. Uh, and it's just a list of all of the sectors that needs to be planned when a hazard makes its impact. It's not just the household. You need to prepare for everything. All of this in the list, these in the list, needs to have plans, anticipatory plans, for each and every type of hazard that may affect a community. And mind you, the Philippines has almost all types of hazards, except maybe for those related to snow. It's not maybe, uh, there's no snow here in the Philippines, but snow-related hazards don't affect us. But practically all other hazards that you can think of, we have here, and they're quite uh, um, more common because we are in the typhoon belt and we are also in the Pacific Ring of Fire. So it's very necessary that we have this equation uh, and the pillars uh, for disaster risk reduction all well planned. We have to address it uh, through the years. We have been trying to build our efforts and uh, we're not yet there, but so far we have done a lot. Early on, uh, after 2010, I think this was in 2013 or up to 2015, uh, our rank in the World Risk Index was number three. We were third to Vanuatu and Tonga in terms of risk. Again, I'd like to remind everybody that there's a difference between risk and hazard. We were the third. But because of the efforts of the Philippines, in 2019, the World Risk Index shows that we are already at number nine, from three to nine. So considering all of those factors of uh, hazards, exposure, and uh, vulnerability through planning of our communities and through the efforts of everybody, a whole of society approach, mainly through planning, we have reduced our ranking in the World Risk Index. Uh, we, were, we started from three and now we are at number nine. So congratulations to us. Hopefully we won't be in the top 10 anymore if we keep on planning and preparing all of the cities and municipalities of the Philippines, all 1,634 cities and municipalities of our country. Now, in terms of measuring the impact of Philippine disasters, it can be measured in terms of uh, either the number of events uh, of the hazards that come in, 
or that make its impact, the number of deaths, the number of affected persons, or the losses, the damage in terms of losses to property. Uh, all of these are important considerations. And from 1901 to 2015, you can see that the storms and floods are the ones that create a lot of havoc. In terms of uh, natural disasters in 2017, by type, you can see that storms, floods are the topmost hazards that we need to prepare for. The landslides, earthquakes, wildfires, uh, drought, uh, and volcanic activity uh, early on uh, this year before the start of the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, we had uh, Taal erupting after several decades of, uh, un uh, of rest. And then it beca became restive. It exploded on uh, January 12, uh, roughly around uh, probably 1 o'clock or 1.30. Uh, but uh, really... Uh, it also caught us by surprise. Uh, there's technology and science that uh, can actually tell us uh, for volcanic activity when uh, a volcano can erupt. But for earthquakes, you cannot really predict it, predict it as to its exact time and when it will happen. When somebody says to you that, uh, oh, an earthquake, a big one, will happen on Tuesday at 10.30, that's a lie. Don't believe it because the current consensus of the scientific community is that nobody can predict an earthquake yet in terms of short-term forecasts. But what this graph is showing to you is that uh, storms and floods are, are, are the most uh, terrible in terms of the hazards, in terms of impacts that has affected us through the years. And in 2017, uh, that, that is also the figures or the figure that is being shown. You can see also that uh, I have crossed out the term natural disasters because if we talk about disasters happening, that means that people were unprepared. So if people were unprepared, they were not smart, they, were not, they did not use uh, the best of their abilities, they did not communicate the knowledge about hazards, they did not communicate prevention and mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. That means that uh, it was man that was responsible for the disaster. It was not man or humans that was responsible for the hazards, but it was it were it was the human. It, it's the human being, the individuals in the community, that were responsible for the disaster. So when you talk about disaster there's always uh, some kind of uh, link to how we have prepared for the hazards impacts. We are in the typhoon belt. You can see all of the typhoons happening and cross entering the Philippine area of responsibility. Uh, uh, that's a lot, practically covering with all of its tracks, the entire uh, Luzon and Visayas. You can see that there are less uh, typhoon tracks overlaying the, the big island of Mindanao. We are also in the Pacific Ring of Fire. The Pacific Ring of Fire simply states that uh, most of the earthquakes that have been recorded occur in, uh, uh, in zones or corridors or earthquake alleys. You might want to think of it that way. Uh, and Around the Pacific Ring of Fire is a corridor or a zone of, of uh, earthquakes. And corresponding to that zone are a lot of volcanoes that have been erupting as well. And because it surrounds the Pacific Ocean, it's called as the Pacific Ring of Fire. Not all earthquakes happen anywhere. They happen in specific zones. And in this region of the world, around the Pacific, it's called as the Pacific Ring of Fire. And uh, it includes Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan, the Aleutian Islands, Alaska, Western United States, uh, Western South America, and it really goes around uh, the Pacific Ocean. That's why, hence the name Pacific Ring of Fire. When we talk about uh, floods, so we, we, I, I uh, started discussing about uh, typhoons and cyclones and hurricanes. Hurricane is just the, the Western equivalent of the name typhoons uh, or, or bagyo in Tagalog. 
uh, when we talk about typhoons, uh, severe weather, thunderstorms, uh, those are phenomena which are not actually the hazards. They bring forth hazards. They, they, they trigger hazards called as floods, landslides, storm surges, and severe wind. So practically, what I'm saying is that uh, because of typhoons and the monsoon rains, the, the rains uh, uh, accumulate they have a downpour, but the rain itself is not the hazard. But when they form floods or when they spawn floods, that is what kills people. That is what damages property. It's the same for landslides. Uh, because of rains, they trigger landslides. You need 100 millimeters of rainfall in most cases to be able to trigger landslides. In most cases, remember. It can also... Uh, do storm surges or trigger storm surges because of the uh, strong winds carried by typhoons. Severe winds can topple trees, can rip off rooftops and get it blown away. And when it lands, it might hit a person and kill a person. Uh, those are the hazards. When we talk about hazards, those are the ones that damage property and uh, kill people. So the phenomenon itself, like a typhoon or monsoon uh, rains or thunderstorms, aren't exactly the hazards. They bring forth hazards, uh, and those related to meteorological hazards are floods, landslides, storm surges, and severe wind. We know about, uh, we are quite familiar. This is Undoy. Uh, those are floods. We have landslides. This is a landslide that happened in Benguet. Uh, which happened, I think, in 2017. Uh, landslides normally happen along steep slopes, but uh, they can also happen in moderate slopes or slopes that are unstable when man does artificial work in a certain area. Storm surges because of the high winds. You might want to think of storm surges as uh, waves that are blown hours. by the wind. Uh, it's probably similar, an analogy would be if you uh, have a coffee cup that is full of coffee. If you blow it, the coffee would spill over the rim of the cup. And the analogy is that uh, the typhoon has strong winds and that's similar to my blowing of the coffee in the cup. So along beaches, when the uh, winds are very high, are very strong, 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers per hour, they make the water of the sea go up and they may be as high as 5, sometimes even reaching 10 meters. Uh, the effects would be variable along the coastline because if there's a cliff, it won't enter land that much. But if the slopes are quite gentle, it may enter up to several kilometers. In Tacloban, the storm surges entered inland two to three kilometers and devastated a lot of populated areas and killed a lot of people, including those in evacuation centers. Uh, we have uh, since identified those places which are most vulnerable, so it's very important that you know your area. Look at maps because maps identify the hazards in your community, in your neighborhood. So know the hazards, not just the phenomenon, but the hazards. For each of these hazards that I talked to you about, for floods, for wind, for storm surges, and for landslides, there are corresponding maps in your community that you can refer to to find out whether you're, you are exposed to a certain type of hazard. So know uh, where to find these maps. These maps are available online in noaa.up.edu.ph. There are also government efforts to do this, to map out the floods, the landslides, uh, the severe wind. You can go to the agency websites and look for them. It's your duty to your family. It's your duty to yourself 
to be able to look at these maps because if you are not aware that you are exposed, when the time comes, you will be caught by surprise. And if there are many people who will be caught by surprise like you in your community, if it's more than 10 that dies there at that community that has been impacted by a certain type of hazard is going to be called a disaster by the international community. So know your hazards in your community because that is the best way to prepare against disasters. Strong winds, there are also maps. Uh, we have examples of this that happened uh, uh, in, in the Philippines. Uh, we have a lot of typhoons, 20 that enter the Philippine area of responsibility. So it's our responsibility to know the hazards because it's not the typhoon that we are really preparing for. We are preparing for the hazards. And you would like to find out whether you are exposed and whether you are vulnerable. So we also have to anticipate, we have to create maps that project scenarios bigger than the hazards of floods, of landslides that we have experienced. Because uh, if we don't prepare for the bigger ones that we remember, then we again will be caught by surprise. So if we combine all of the hazards together, we have what we call as multi-scenario, multi-hazard. These are landslide maps and these are flood maps. So combining storm surge, uh, floods, and landslide scenarios. These are different types of hazards associated with uh, severe weather. And when we put them together, you have what we call as a probabilistic multi-scenario based multi-hazard map. Uh, map. So you would find uh, your community there, you would find uh, places that are not uh, that vulnerable and not that exposed to hazards. And that is really, the, the, those are really the places which the community should develop. Because even if the hazard comes, even if the hazard strikes, there will be no losses because you plan your community away from the path of the hazards or where the hazards will impact. Now we go to earthquakes. Uh, again, nobody dies from the earthquake per se. It's the hazards that kill people. So the hazards associated with earthquakes are ground rupture, collapse of structures, fire, landslides, ground subsidence, liquefaction, and tsunamis. So there's a variant, uh, there's what we call a sage, which happens in pools or bodies, bodies of water, like a lake, uh, an enclosed body of water. Uh, we experienced that uh, last uh, 20, I think that was in 2017 or 2018. Uh, no, sorry, it was in 2019 uh, during that earthquake in Zambales. It was felt in Metro Manila and a lot of pools shook. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of waves in the pools. Uh, that's called as a sage. It can happen in a lake, like Laguna Lake. Now, uh, let's tackle this one by one. Ground rupture, collapse of structures, fire landslides, ground subsidence, liquefaction, and tsunamis. Uh, you don't want to build on top of a fault. In the Philippines, our buffer zone is about five meters left and right of a fault. So you must understand, or you must know, where the fault is. Uh, PVOLX has a, a website called Fault Finder where you can find uh, all of the active faults. When, when buying property or, or building a, your house, you don't want to build on top of a fault because if it ruptures, uh, it will get your building to probably look like that or your house to look like that. And you really don't want that to happen. Faults are like this. Uh, there are breaks in the rock, where in the blocks uh, at opposite sides of the fracture or the crack that you're seeing uh, has moved. So that one is a fault. Uh, you don't want your house to be on top of that because if that fault moves, chances are your, your house will get ripped apart. Uh, again, people don't get shaken. Uh, by earthquakes, it's the collapse of structures. If we follow the building code, uh, then there's a lot that 
uh, we can prevent. Uh, the building code makes our houses and our buildings withstand ground shaking. So it's important to follow the building code when constructing a house or a building. It has to be followed strictly because we're in an earthquake belt. Uh, the threat of earthquakes are const is constant. And uh, we need to prepare and uh, the threat or the hazard from earthquakes called this ground shaking can be addressed uh, at least to a certain degree by our building code. So follow the building code. Um, this is just the intensity of earthquakes. There are maps. Uh, when an earthquake happens, if the ground uh, material is the same, uh, the intensity of ground shaking is also the same within 10 kilometers. And then after 10 kilometers, the shaking of the ground rapidly dissipates or attenuates. So know where your faults are, know how far you are from the fault because that would determine the intensity of the ground shaking, which is also dependent on the magnitude of the earthquake that will happen in your area. And there are also ways to find out what magnitude uh, a certain fault uh, could do. Like for example, they have predicted that the Marikina Valley Fault or the Valley, West Valley Fault can produce a magnitude 7.2 earthquake. Uh, that magnitude 7.2 earthquake is quite large. It's similar to the uh, Bohol earthquake, which was also of that same magnitude. And when that happened, those people who were living close to the earthquake source or the what we call as the epicenter could not stand on the ground because of the ground shaking. Uh, and they had to kneel. Uh, uh, they had to kneel and uh, sometimes their palms also on asphalt ground. And because the ground was uh, shaking terribly, uh, it was rubbing on their knees and palms and there was a lot of blood on their palms and, and, and knees according to the stories of the survivors. So know where the fault is because that would determine how close you are and that would also determine the intensity of ground shaking which is dependent on the magnitude expected for a certain type of fault. Uh, there are maps for the presence of the faults. There are also maps for the intensity. Know where or what intensity there is. So there are also maps. Uh, PVOLX uh, has this. They have prepared these hazard maps. Uh, and of course, landslides is another earthquake hazard. Uh, there are also landslide uh, maps brought about by earthquakes. They trigger earthquakes. When the ground shakes terribly, uh, a lot of ground is loosened up and landslides may occur. So know if you're, you are in a landslide prone area. Uh, there are maps for this. Uh, your office, your house, you might want to determine if they are in that kind of place. Uh, map similar to this one in Bohol. You can see that all of those yellow marks are, are, are the areas where landslides happen. And they happen where it was predicted to happen. All of those red marks, which are what we call as landslide hazard maps. So in Metro Manila, uh, here along the West Valley Fault or the Marikina Valley Fault, there are some pockets, some places which are prone to hazards. Fire is another type of hazard. You might want to prepare for this. Uh, close the gas valves. We don't want the gas to leak out and uh, have a fire starting from that gas leak. Uh, in the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, many of the deaths uh, or much of the damage was due, was due to fire after the earthquake. And we have to prepare for that. When the ground shakes and the uh, gravel and sand mixes with water, it liquefies. It uh, looks like muddy liquid. And if something is, is on top of that, like a building, uh, after liquefaction, the buildings would sway and of course, because it's ground that has liquefied, it will not go back. So it will maintain its position and you would have lost the value of your property. You cannot live 
there anymore. So to address this liquefaction hazard, uh, one has to follow the building code, check whether the construction was correct or not. There are also maps. Find out whether your house or office or the school of your child is in a liquefiable area and ask whether that school was built to withstand liquefaction. Uh, okay. Uh, the tsunami uh, uh, problem or hazard is also very important to prepare for. When the fault offshore along the Manila Trench moves, it will take about a minute to reach Manila Bay and about uh, probably 30 minutes to reach uh, Bataan. So we have to prepare for this. We have to know, uh, we have to have seismometers uh, that uh, would detect. We have to have preparations before the Manila Trench moves. We have to have a lot of studies that would tell us what the potential magnitude is because that would tell us the potential height of the tsunamis that would hit uh, Roas Boulevard and how much uh, inland inundation will happen. We know that there are a lot of people that are exposed there and we have to prepare in advance all of the cities and municipalities along coastlines. We have a lot of faults surrounding the Philippines and the potential for generating uh, a lot of tsunamis, uh, the threat of tsunamis is a reality. We have to protect uh, the people along our coastlines. Again, there are maps that uh, are available. Uh, were made available on websites. Uh, you can look for it. You can ask uh, whether your community is in a tsunami-prone area. That is the best way to define the hazards in a map, to determine whether you are exposed, and to determine also whether you are vulnerable. If you have the capacity to move out, how much time it takes to move out, if you will be able to do that uh, if the tsunami happens in your area. Uh, storm surges, uh, that is in the hydrometeorological uh, hazards part, but uh, we also have maps for that. Now finally, there's another type of uh, uh, phenomenon called, called as volcanism. Well, volcanoes erupt. We have a lot of volcanoes in the Philippines. But it's not just the, the volcanic eruption that we need to consider. Uh, in fact, we need to consider more the hazards uh, brought about by that volcanic phenomenon or a volcano uh, being restive or having volcanic activity or erupting. And these hazards are as follows. Pyroclastic flows, pyroclastic fall, debris avalanches, lahar, lava, tsunami, noxious gas. Like the hazards associated with severe weather, and those associated with earthquakes, all of these hazards must have corresponding maps. And you have to look at all the volcanoes. Uh, if you're near a volcano, you look at the hazard maps so that you can prepare. Uh, maybe a brief description of what these pyroclastic flows uh, are all about. A picture would best describe what it is. It's a hot density current that flows down the flanks of the volcano. In French, they called as Noé Ardant, or hot glowing clouds. So that picture is of Mayon. Uh, of Mayon. Uh, it erupted before. It's black and white. It's an old picture. You can see that plume going up. What comes up, especially the heavy, heavy stuff, must come down. And when they roll down the flanks of the volcano, that's a lot of hot materials. It's a glowing cloud that travels very fast and it's very dangerous. And when you get snuffed by that kind of hot glowing cloud, you will die for sure. Uh, that is what happened in, 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 uh, the, the, in St. Pierre in Martinique. It's the Paris of the West Indies. It destroyed the entire town. It used to be the uh, harbor city of uh, that area touted as the Paris of the West Indies, a favorite uh, place where the French would frolic and would uh, go to uh, for their uh, holidays, but it got destroyed 
totally, completely. Only one person survived that and he eventually turned out to become a part of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. That is what happened. That is what killed people in Pompeii as well in, in, when Vesuvius erupted in, uh, <clears throat> not sure, 1709 or 1729. You, that's your assignment. Uh, you try to find out when that uh, uh, volcano erupted uh, and how it killed the people in Pompeii. There, there are movies uh, that uh, have been shown about uh, how it killed people. That picture, is the, uh, that, that man or that uh, cast is still there. If you go to Pompeii now, it's a, it's a, a very famous tourist place, a uh, very famous tourist attraction. It tells us of the, uh, the harsh impact of a pyroclastic flow. So you, you might want to try to escape, but you will never be able to escape if you are enveloped by the pyroclastic cloud. Of course, Mayon volcano also erupted, and you can see it erupting there, shooting up high, and there's that cloud that went lateral and went down. Those are pyroclastic flows cascading down the slopes of Mayon volcano. Of course, pyroclastic fall, when it rains ash, it would settle down on the ground. It's very heavy. Uh, it's about 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So if it settles on your, on your rooftops, you might want to sweep it off because when you sweep it off, you reduce the risk of the roof falling down due to the weight of the pyroclastic fall, which might kill you if the entire roof collapses on your head. Landslides, that's also a main problem uh, associated with volcanoes. Mount St. Helens, oops, like this one, uh, in 1980 collapsed. There was a huge sector of the volcano that collapsed and when it collapsed, it reduced the pressure and triggered, triggered a violent eruption. And these landslides called as debris avalanches can travel very far. We've had some examples of debris avalanches in the Philippines. That was in Iriga. Uh, part of the volcano collapsed and it traveled 10 to 11 kilometers. That's very, very far. And if you think that you're safe 10 or 11 kilometers away from the foot of the volcano, you might be wrong because debris avalanches can travel several kilometers from its source when they happen. So look at the maps for landslides associated with volcanoes and see if you are exposed. Lahars, uh, everybody is familiar with the lahar, what a lahar is. We've had several of those happening uh, after the Pinatubo erupted, several years after. We've had lahars uh, during Reming or, or Typhoon Durian that killed almost 2,000 people uh, along the foot slopes of Mayon Volcano. But also in Nevado del Ruiz, it killed 23,000 people. So it can really be devastating if you don't prepare for, for these hazards uh, associated with volcanoes. Lavas are hot molten rock. Uh, these are the glowing stuff that you see being released. Uh, it was released uh, during the Taal eruption at night. There was uh, a lot of lava that was uh, 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 spewed by the mouth of the volcano. And that is called as a hot molten rock that has reached the surface. So these are other pictures of lavas uh, that you can see being thrown out of the crater map. Of course, tsunamis. Uh, earthquakes are not the only sources of tsunamis. When a volcano collapses in water, such as what happened in Anak Krakatau and also uh, when Krakatau volcano erupted in the late 1800s, it generated big ocean waves or giant ocean waves called as tsunamis. But this time around, it was not generated or triggered by an earthquake. It was triggered by a volcanic eruption, a collapse uh, that was heard uh, a long way up to the Philippines. Uh, the, the impact was was uh, quite large. 
those are probably sound waves that you're seeing and it killed a lot of people. During that time, the late 1800s, 60,000 people died along the coasts of Sumatra and Java. Of course, gases can be released by, uh, by volcanoes, gases such as CO2, they're heavier than air, uh, they're denser than the air in the atmosphere, and they're invisible. Uh, in, in 1986, in Lake Nias, in Cameroon, it killed 1,700 people as it flowed along the slopes of the volcano and creeped into the communities and uh, uh, killed a lot of people uh, in those communities, including livestock. <clears throat> so that's noxious gas. Uh, that's another hazard associated with volcanoes. So we discussed all of the different types of hazards associated with severe weather, with earthquakes, and volcanism. Again, it's not really the phenomenon that, it, that is the hazard. It's not the phenomenon that we really have to prepare for. We have to prepare for the hazards that are spawned or triggered by all of these natural phenomena. Uh, that's a lot of work. We need to identify where they would impact that can be seen from maps. We need to determine if our house or our office or the school where our children go to are exposed to those hazards. We have to uh, determine our capability to flee from the hazard when it happens so that uh, we can do something about it uh, long before uh, it happens and not just a couple of seconds when it happens. Normally in the country, our response, our, our attention to or our ability to address disasters is through response, which is incorrect. Uh, it's too late. We don't act until it's too late, until it's about 30 seconds or one minute before the hazard makes its impact. We have to prepare long in advance because it involves a lot of work. It involves identification of all of the hazards from all of these different triggering phenomena. It involves identification of the exposed areas, your house, the buildings, and it has, it, it has to be identified and planned accordingly. You don't want to build in areas that are always stricken by hazards. You'll save a lot if you plan well and if you avoid those places. And of course, uh, there's also such a thing as increasing the capacity of people. Knowledge is increasing the capacity of people to address the impacts of hazards. So in, in a warning system, it's not really just the warning that is given to us by our government agencies, by the NDRRMC. Because if we just listen to those warnings, it's going to be too late. A people-centered early warning system involves risk knowledge, which is systematically collecting data and undertaking risk assessments, which is what I talked about. It's about developing hazards, the monitoring ability, the use of technology, and that is the responsibility of the government agencies. So it's only a small a, a part of that early warning system, which is people-centered. It's only one-fourth. That's the responsibility. It's the duty of government to be able to give you good warning uh, using the best available technologies and the best available science. Once we have determined what the hazards are, what places would be affected, uh, it's important that we plan and disseminate uh, through communication, through media, through planning, through information education campaigns, the risk and the early warnings. And we need to understand it, not just minutes before the hazard strikes, but long before. So it must be in our school curricula or curriculum. Uh, K-9, to about climate change, about the different types of hazards, it needs to be embedded because we cannot just learn all of these things minutes before its impact. 
we need to get this ingrained in our minds, part of our muscle memory. Uh, it has to be there. It has to be part of our culture. We have to have that belief system that is appropriate to address all of this knowledge about hazards. All of this knowledge about how to address these hazards, which is actually risk reduction. And then that leads us to the concept of response capability. Once we have that knowledge, once we have that technical know-how, that ability to predict when through forecasts a certain hazard will impact, we can communicate that along with that risk knowledge to the people, each and every individual down to family level. That is what we call as response capability. When, we, when all of this uh, is complete, risk knowledge, monitoring and warning, dissemination, and response capability are in place, we have what we call a people-centered early warning system, which involves government, which involves you, me, the community, and everybody. To be able to make it work, there needs to be participation of everybody. After all, everybody is under threat from all of these hazards in our country, and we need to make this uh, working put in place because if we do not, we will just wait for the next disaster to strike and count dead bodies and count loss, losses in terms of property damage. We have to do it now. We don't do it days or minutes before the hazard makes its impact and turn into what we call as a disaster. Thank you. Taas kamay ang mga bagong bayani Sa harap ng pagsuko Huwag kang susuko Bigyan ang boses ang sigaw ng masa Ang bagong pag-asa ay Mula si Oo Mula si Oo Mula si Oo Panibagong pag-asa ay mula si Oo